If you please open the Word of God with me to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in the 15th chapter. We actually just read from it in that same section there, except we're going to be beginning in verse 12. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. I want to begin by just reiterating what an honor it is to be here with you all on this blessed Easter weekend and Easter Sunday. Uh, We are greatly, uh, greatly encouraged by the work of King's Church and the ministry of Pastor John. He is in many ways a kindred spirit um, to us at Apologia Church, and we send you greetings from there. I, along uh, with my family, send you greetings and happy Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who died and is now alive forevermore. Amen? Amen. And so we do, of course, wish Pastor John a speedy recovery and lots of rest and apologies in advance. You do not get a delicious accent in delivering the (laughs) word today. (laughs) However, nonetheless, I am very pleased to be with you. Uh, We will go ahead and read our section of scripture here, and then by God's grace, I will get to work. Amen? Amen? All right. This is the word of the living God. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection... It is plain that he is accepted, who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Will you please join me in praying? Our Heavenly Father, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. So the Apostle Paul in our text today, we actually heard the first part of it read just a few moments ago, in regards to the all-encompassing importance of the event of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that event in history is something that God has done. He has accomplished that great work of salvation and confirmed the gospel story. And through this repetition that we find here in the 15th chapter, he reminds us that if we do not serve a risen Lord, then we may as well not even be here today. There is no future. We're still in our sins. 
And we are to be pitied because our religion is worthless. Ultimately, this sermon and this preaching itself is in vain if Christ be not raised from the grave. So how essential is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you reject it, you have rejected the gospel itself. It is definitional to the historic faith. And our faith, brothers and sisters, is a historic faith rooted in God's revelation and dealings with man as anticipated and expected in the scriptures. You hear this constant refrain in the 15th chapter, according to the scriptures. This is the culmination of God's redemptive plan in history, according to the scriptures. Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried in accordance with the scriptures. He was raised in accordance with the scriptures. This is not a novelty in history, brothers and sisters. It is part of the plan of God that he promised long ago by the prophets and in the law and in the Psalms. This story began long ago before you and I were swept up into it. This good news of God that God has made us partakers of and this is the same God that made all things before resting from his work and creation. And this is the same God that has made purification for sins and rested from his work in recreation. Or so the author of Hebrews tells us. Recall that even on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, the disciples were chastised for being foolish and slow of heart to believe all that God had spoken through the prophets. And I love what Jesus does with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. He takes them to the most epic Bible study in the history of mankind, doesn't he? When he says, starting with the prophets, he taught them all the things concerning himself. How would you like that? The Lord of glory, risen, giving you from A to Z all the scripture's testimony concerning himself, his person, his ministry, and his work in the world. That must have been tremendous and awe-inspiring. And so, it is so important for us today as Christians, living in our modern context, that when we proclaim the gospel, the good news about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, we have to remember something here. That when we proclaim this message, yes, Jesus died. Yes, he was buried. Yes, he was raised. Yes, he is ascended to the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning as Lord of heaven and earth. That we're coming in at the end of the story. When we share gospel headlines with the world, and even with our non-believing friends and family and the culture at large, these headlines, if you will, right? Jesus died for sinners. He rose again. Maybe even he has a wonderful plan for your life. You tend to hear that message proclaimed a lot in our modern evangelical context. These are gospel headlines. They are fragmented bits of information, and yes, you do not have the gospel without them. The gospel is not less than that. However, they are just that, headlines that require a broader context in order to fully appreciate the scope and implications of this massive redemptive work that God is doing in history, the work that he has accomplished, yes, but the work that he is continuing to carry out in our day today. And so the story of God's good news does not begin with the resurrection. It doesn't even begin at the cross or the incarnation of our Lord Jesus in which God came into the world, took on flesh, and was identified with us in every possible conceivable way, yet without sin. The story does not begin there. The good news does not begin in the empty tomb, but in a garden with our first parents. And if you recall, even the proclamation of the first evangel in Genesis chapter 3, what did God say to Adam and Eve in earshot of the serpent? He said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, that there was going to be a redeemer to come and turn back the effects of sin's curse in all the world, and he was going to set all things right, and he was going to turn back the works of of the devil and of Satan and of sin in the world. And this work of the Messiah was promised in history. 
the great redeemer to come. But the story begins with a man. The text we just read in 1 Corinthians. The first man, Adam. Through one man came death. In Adam, all die. And so through another man has come the resurrection. In Christ shall all be made alive. That's the story. There are acts in God's great symphony. Act one, by a man came death into the world. And sin and all those consequences that resulted from that first act of transgression and disobedience. There is a second act. Through a man comes the resurrection of the dead. And then, as we'll see from the text, there is a final act that we are privileged and honored as God's saints, his consecrated people to actually participate in, in God's work in history. But I want to focus this morning and zero in on the text with us here and talk about really one primary idea, understanding the full scope of this good news and asking the question, why is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ good news? Why is it good news that Jesus defeated, overcame, and has vanquished our greatest adversary in death? And I want to begin by saying this. The resurrection is good news because it tells the truth about what's really wrong with us. And by us, I mean humanity, human beings. The resurrection reminds all of us that our greatest problem is not that we lack education, different circumstances, self-esteem, or the absolute freedom to indulge our every desire without constraint of any kind, as our society likes to believe. No, Scripture confronts us with the reality of the curse brought on us by the first Adam, And due to that disobedience, all of humanity, which Adam represents, was plunged into an endless cycle of death and frustration. That is act one of the story. Though creation was proclaimed to be good, you recall what it says in the book of Genesis, when God made everything in existence, he calls it what? Good. And even when he made man in his image, male and female together, bearing his image, he calls that very good. And though creation was proclaimed to be good, due to sin's entrance into the world, we fell from that original righteousness and holiness into a condition and state of misery. Now humanity experiences an endless cycle of frustration, despair, hopelessness, and ultimately destruction, because that's what sin brings into the world. It's what it brings into our lives And it's what brings into the world around us. And this payment that we are due, this wage, the Bible says, for our transgressions, our disobedience against God, our violation of his law, is death. Death. For we are dead in our trespasses and sins and by nature children of wrath. And so this condition places us at enmity with our maker, enslaved to our passions. All individuals and societies are plagued by this problem of sin. We don't recognize that the problem is within us. It's not in our environment or in our circumstances. It runs right through the religious root of who we are. The Bible calls this the heart. The heart is the problem. The heart of the matter is the heart, filled with sin and corruption And so, humanity's strategy, because we believe this to be external to us, the problems are all out there, not in here, not where Jesus says they are, right? Out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and slander and malice and all of that. Jesus says the origin is right here within us. We're the problem. Mankind's solution is to this, is to exercise absolute control over every area of life and enforce that control on everyone else in an attempt to change our environment through re-education, redistribution, rehabilitation. But you know, the problem is none of those things will fix what's really wrong with us. We need resurrection. 
We need to be made alive. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not make bad people good. It makes dead people alive. That is the message of the gospel. That's what it actually accomplishes. Our problem is that while we are physically alive, we are spiritually stillborn. And no amount of trying will salvage our broken relationship with our Creator. But we have to understand, when we talk about God's redemption, His renewal, the reconciliation and restoration of all things in Christ Jesus, this beautiful story that God is telling, we have to understand what was lost. What is God reconciling? What is He restoring us to? What is He renewing? Everything that was forfeited by our first parents in the garden and more because of the expansive and ongoing work of the Lord Jesus. We, as fallen sons and daughters of Adam, cannot get back to the garden despite all of our best efforts. And because of the problem of sin, we are constantly frustrated, despairing, without hope, alienated from God. We feel alone in this wilderness, and for good reason, because we are out of fellowship with our Creator. And the Bible tells us that there is a way in which those things are reconciled, and only one way. Our need is seen in that we are in need of being delivered from the dominion of darkness and sin's pollution and restored to the glory of our calling as God's image bearers. This was Adam's calling. Subdue creation into a God-glorifying culture and then hand that kingdom over to the Father. That was Adam's original calling. He failed. He forfeited his birthright and plunged all of us into a condition of sin and misery as a result. In Adam, all die. Why is the resurrection good news? Because it tells us what's really wrong with us. It's also good news because it reveals our need for a redeemer. And this act two of the story, where the first Adam failed, the last Adam has come to reconcile this fallen creation back to God, and you and I, if we are in Christ, are wrapped up in that cosmic plan. Right? Our salvation is much bigger than just my individual forgiveness with God and my place with Him for all eternity. It's much larger in scope, and we often don't consider those implications and what they mean for the way that we ought to live. We rejoice in our forgiveness and in our place with Jesus Christ because of what God has done. But do we often enough contemplate the full scope of this story and what God is doing now in the world? What we are most in need of is what God promised would take place under His new covenant. You remember the problem? The problem of the heart? How does God remedy that? How does He fix it? Well, he promised. He told us how he would do that very thing in the promise of the new covenant, did he not? He said, I'm going to vindicate the holiness of my great name through my covenant people. They have profaned my name among the nations, and so what I'm going to do is I am going to sprinkle clean water on them, and I'm going to clean them from all their uncleannesses, and from all their idols I will sprinkle them. And I'm going to take out the heart of stone and I'm going to replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and I'm going to put my very spirit within them, and I'm going to cause them to walk in my statutes and love my commandments and my law and yearn to serve me. That's what I'm going to do. And the Bible, of course, refers to this as the new birth, in which Jesus alludes to when he's speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, right? What does he tell him? He says, you have to be born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. That's what has to happen. It's new birth. It's the resurrecting grace of Jesus Christ alone that can send you and I home completely clean from our sins. That's it. As our brother Peter reminds us, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
God saves sinners. Amen. That is the message. That is the good news. He doesn't help them save themselves. Only a perfect Savior can satisfy the demands of divine justice that have come about. The need for that has come about because we have broken God's law. That's why Christ had to die. Why did Christ go to the cross? Why was he delivered up for our, uh, why was he delivered up to the tree? Why did he go there? Why was he so set on his mission? Why did he set his face like flint to go to that tree? Because of the vindication of God's justice and his name, which we have sullied by our acts of disobedience and sin. It was our sin that put Jesus on that cross. It was our sin that nailed him there. That's what he was doing there. That's what he was paying for. He was giving God justice at the cross. How concerned is God for justice? Jesus had to come and die to satisfy justice. We owe a life to God that we could not live, and so Jesus has come to live that life perfectly on our behalf and satisfy the demands of divine justice that come about as a result of perfect obedience. Theologians refer to that as the active and passive obedience of Jesus Christ. Jesus endured the penalty for our sins, right? The Bible says he became a curse. He took the curse of our transgressions. He bore the full weight of the wrath of God in our place on that cross. It was all poured out on him, passive obedience. And he lived the perfect life that God calls us to live, that, but, but that we have utterly failed to live. And so when God looks upon us in Jesus, he doesn't see our wretched, miserable lives. He sees the perfect life of his son and his righteous obedience in our place because we're in him. And he looks at Jesus as if he lived my wretched life. That is the great exchange of the gospel. If you erase that, you have no good news. That is the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ, his vicarious atonement. It is the great exchange. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, sin on our behalf, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. My sin for his righteousness. The good news. As our office bearer, Jesus took on our human nature that he may identify with his people and represent them perfectly before God as their substitute. What does the resurrection, what does the resurrection say about Jesus? Jesus. How does it vindicate his work and his person? He was who he said he was. That's what the resurrection says about him. He is God. The reason he was rewarded with resurrection was that only a perfect life of full obedience could merit that reward. As Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, this gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. The resurrection was God's declaration of who Jesus was, his confirmation of his identity and his acceptance of his finished work. The resurrection proves that Jesus was not merely a good man with a few moral teachings, that he was not the health and wealth and your best life now Jesus, or the social justice Marxist Jesus, or an eco-friendly progressive Jesus, or an LGBTQ ally Jesus, but the divine Son of God. He is the image of the invisible God, not some idol we can remake in our image. Did you hear the catechism? Second commandment. It's not just basic instruction. Think on this for a moment. Who Jesus is. He is not a God of your imagination. He is the God of Scripture that reveals himself, and we must come to him on his terms, not ours. He is not a God to be trifled with. We must worship him and come to him on his terms. That's what the resurrection reminds us of. Next, the resurrection is good news because it gives us the assurance of peace with God. The resurrection is good, no good news because it gives us the assurance of peace with God. 
the fact that the tomb is empty proves that the payment for sin has been accepted. If the payment for sin has been accepted, then there's nothing left to add to that finished work. There's no offering that you need to provide as a supplement to the finished work of Jesus Christ. We understand supplements, don't we? We take them in order to improve upon things that we are not getting through natural means. We must be supplemented. The righteousness of God in Jesus Christ is not like that. It doesn't need help. That's why we're not saved by works of righteousness done by us, but by the finished works righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's His work. Romans 4, 23 through 25, Paul is talking about Father Abraham and how he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This was long before Jesus came. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The resurrection is proof that when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished before he died, that it really was finished. That when he said that, he meant it. He didn't accomplish a hypothetical redemption. It was an actual completed work. And that's why you and I can say, he died for me. He died for me. He secured my redemption, and if you're in him, he secured your redemption. As Christians, we do not finish in the flesh what God began in the spirit. All of life is to be lived in the power of grace, for although we have good works to do, we were not saved by them, but by the work that he has accomplished. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Christ, who is God in the flesh, suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That's once again from our brother Peter. Next, why is the resurrection good news? It's good news because, believer, sin will not have dominion over you. Amen. When Christ died, not only was that the death of sin's penalty, the curse that was upon us for our transgressions, but it meant also that sin lost its power in your life and in my life, not just the penalty of sin. Yes, we will be saved from the presence of sin one day, as 1 Corinthians 15 makes clear. Death will be destroyed. All of Christ's enemies will be placed under his feet as a footstool. Suffering, bodily ailments, all those things that our brother referred to before the service, all of those things will be gone and swallowed up along with death itself, suffering, sickness, we will be saved from the presence of sin and the effects of the curse. We have been saved from the penalty of sin because of the righteousness of our Lord Jesus. But as we are now being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, Christ has also provided in that sanctification freedom from sin's power. It will not have dominion over you, believer. Whatever sins in your life that you are laboring to put to death, know this, in God's power, you will overcome and be victorious. Sin will not have dominion over you because you are under grace. What does that mean? Not that the law is no longer irrelevant to you as a believer. It's the very standard to which you are being conformed, the image of Jesus Christ. What it does mean is that you have a new principle within you that is making war against your flesh. And the light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Sin will not have dominion over you. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Right, that, that blessed section there, right at the beginning, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right, for, for God has done what the law could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us who walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. Because in the flesh, we have no hope whatsoever to have victory over our sin. 
It's only by the power of God's agency and the Holy Spirit within us that we can put the flesh to death and all of its subsequent works. You have no hope. Killing sin is a Christian business. You don't give that to unbelievers and say, hey, kill your sin. There's no power to bring it about. They need to be born again first and have a new power within them present in order to vanquish the acts of the devil and of the flesh. You can be free from the fear of death because Jesus has abolished it, bringing immortality to light through his good news. He can deliver anyone who trusts in him from the fear of death that they are in bondage to. That's the power of our sin right there is fear of death. And the reason we are afraid of death, the reason fallen humanity shudders at the thought of meeting their maker is because we know we're guilty. We know deep down. We know we have a problem. And what we need is the assurance that our sins are forgiven in order to experience the joy that can be ours in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. What is that joy? It is the joy of knowing that your sins are forgiven, that there's nothing left to pay. There's peace with God now. There's nothing necessary to be added to that work. I am forgiven. God no longer counts my sins against me. He will not remember my sin anymore. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sin. Are you the blessed man today? Has God forgotten your sin? I pray that you can answer yes because you have turned from sin to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Next, why is the resurrection good news? Well, because it makes eternal life a present reality. A present reality. The, typically the way that the gospel has been preached in the modern evangelical context is this. Do you know you're a sinner? Okay, great. Who doesn't? Okay, sinner. Well, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Close your eyes, slip up your hand, say this prayer with me, this magic prayer, and Jesus will take you to heaven when you die. And that is the message that we have proclaimed for a very long time in our nation and abroad, or any variation of it. But here's the thing. Eternal life is not just going to heaven when you die. If you are in Christ, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, which means eternal life is a present reality for you now. What does Jesus say? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. In Christ, we have a new nature. That's why the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are a new creature. There is the power of heaven because God himself is taking up residence within you by his Holy Spirit. Eternal life has begun now. That's the point. It is a present reality. Heaven is where Jesus is. And as we advance his kingdom with his presence within us, as his ambassadors in the world, we are bringing heaven to earth. That's what the church of the living God does. It's not just in these four walls and in these pews that we advance the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God, the reign of the Messiah in every area of life. And we advance that rule where we bring his presence into and seek to subdue creation for his glory by bringing all of it in, into subjection to him. Now that happens through worship. It happens through service in our lives and our various vocations and our education in our raising of our families and all of those things that are essential kingdom work. But it is not limited to the institutional church, and to this really, really important job of the man in the pulpit preaching the word. No, the kingdom of God is much broader than just the institutional church. Amen. All of our lives and all of our vocations and every part of us, everything that we do has value in service to the kingdom. All of our work. That's why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, brethren, be steadfast and immovable. Your work in the Lord is not in vain. 
None of it. It all matters if it's carried out in the power of God by His Spirit. If you lay it down in faith, God will raise it up from the dead. That's why Paul can say confidently, I die every day. This resurrection life is lived in the power of Christ. And I die to myself. And wherever I die to myself, the kingdom advances. Because that's what Jesus did. What does the Bible say about him? What does he say? How does he interpret his own ministry? He says, unless a kernel goes into the ground and dies, it cannot bear much fruit or any fruit. It has to die first. Life has to be laid down. There has to be a sacrifice. And when we follow in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are raised to life, not just in the life to come, but now. And what we offer to him as worship that we lay down in faith, trusting in him, he will raise it up. And the curse will be driven back wherever it is found. Let me say something about that, brothers and sisters. No other worldview or political ideology has that power. Amen. Nothing. The same power that was at work in creation is at work now in the gospel and at work in you if you're a Christian. It is an explosive power, right? Dunamis is the word that's used. It's where we get our word dynamite. It's an explosive power that allows us to live and work to the glory of God despite the ever-changing nature of our surroundings, circumstances, and environment. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Every opportunity is an opportunity for obedience to God. We don't have to be in bondage to the past. Curses are broken. Sinful habits are cut off. The power of sin, hell, and Satan are destroyed in Jesus Christ forever. Nothing else has that power the resurrection is good news because it reminds us that in Christ, everything wrong with this world is being made right. Praise God. And wow, that is good news, considering the darkness of the hour that we have been called to live in. And it is a dark hour. There's no disputing that. We need to be honest about that. The time that God has called us to live in, the faithfulness that is going to be needed to represent Christ as his ambassadors. We are called to faithfulness, trusting God with the results. But the resurrection proves something, that all men will answer to God, which means there is no way to peace without coming to him exclusively through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Acts 17, 31 says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You understand what that means, don't you? Christ being raised from the dead proves that we are all coming out of the grave. There is a resurrection of the just and the unjust coming, and all men everywhere are accountable to him. No one's getting away with any acts of evil committed in this life. All will be set right. And Jesus is the only one who knows the way out of the grave. Therefore, he is the one God is authorized to execute judgment. His resurrection is proof that there will be justice. There will be justice. If it doesn't happen in this life through God's temporal means in the civil magistrate and God's deacon carrying out justice, if it doesn't happen in that way, it will be made right when the Lord comes again. And that's part of the act that we get to participate in as Christians, advancing and reinstalling the righteousness of God in the earth by the way that we live for him. And that's the final act, right? Act one, in Adam all die. Act two, by a man has come the resurrection from the dead. The final act, the Bible tells us that Jesus was not only resurrected, but that he ascended to the right hand of authority in heaven, where he reigns now, subduing all of his enemies and ours until he hands the kingdom over to the Father. Remember the calling of Adam? He was to subdue creation, take dominion, and hand the kingdom over to the Father. He failed. Jesus has restored that mission to his people. 
He has consecrated us as his priest kings. That's what Adam was in the garden. He was a king. He was consecrated for service unto God. And he was charged with the task of godly service and worship and dominion. And Jesus Christ as our prophet, priest, and king, as our office bearer, has saved us and commissioned us for service to him as his prophets, priests, and kings, representing him. And no matter how dark this world looks now, Paul assures us that Christ is in fact reigning and will continue to reign until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. This is challenging for us. We tend to think of the resurrection as just happening to individuals. But the scriptures communicate to us that what God did on the cross, the blood that he shed, not only purchased individual sinners from the wrath of God, but it bought this entire fallen cosmos. Colossians 1.19 tells us, For in him, that's Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That means whether we're talking about law, education, politics, arts, sciences, all of those things are under the dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to subdue them for him. Now, we have allowed the world and the culture to do that in, in previous generations, and we are reaping the fruit of that as of right now. But in Christ Jesus, God has saved us for service to him in all of these areas, and that's how come we can say all of these things are relevant and our work is relevant in all that we do. Jesus is, according to Paul, the first fruits. He says in our text, Christ, the first fruits. Because he was raised, we also will be. God consecrated Christ as a sin offering, and Christ has consecrated us as his people for our priestly service unto God. Remember in Romans chapter 3, that verse we all know very, very well? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul is talking about in that passage what was lost and what Jesus is in the business of recovering and restoring and distributing to his people, the glory of our calling as God's image bearers. That is the connection, right? The good news does not just begin at the cross or at the empty tomb, but in the garden, and Jesus stands right at the center of it connecting the two. We have to understand that and be able to proclaim it. Not only will we have glorified, resurrected bodies like our Lord and one day look upon him face to face and get to spend eternity with him, but we get to participate with him now in the work that he is doing to bring all things under his subjection. Yes, our citizenship is most assuredly in heaven, and we await the redemption of our bodies, but the same power that raised Christ from the dead already lives in us and is doing this work in us and in the world by the same power that enables him to subject all things to himself. He is making all things new. How can we believe as Christians that a power like this can't change the hearts of men? or governments, or nations, every institution, because this power transforms everything, everything it comes into contact with. Everywhere the kingdom advances, the curse is driven back, and light shines into darkness. So why is the resurrection good news? It is proof that God will make all things right. And lastly, the resurrection is good news because this message is what brought our faith into being in the first place. Have you noticed something? As Brother John read the text from 1 Corinthians 15 and the proclamation of the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus was proclaimed there, we have to notice something. I want to point this out to you. Ours is a historic faith. There's no disputing that. There is ample evidence to prove that Jesus Christ did, in fact, rise from the dead. Paul even cites one of those in the text, eyewitness accounts, right? He, he even appeared to me. I was an eyewitness of his majesty. And he appeared to 
at least 500 eyewitnesses at one time. According to biblical law, how many witnesses do you need to establish in order to be credible? Two to three, 500. Yes, there is wonderful evidence for the resurrection of the dead, the empty tomb, the transformed life of the apostles, uh, the transformation of the world, uh, the, of course, prophetic fulfillment of the Messiah and all those prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about his coming. But have you noticed that the apostles were not as concerned with proving the resurrection as they were with proclaiming it? This letter to the church at Corinth was read to those that were not eyewitnesses. Are you, were you an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus and his resurrection? And yet you're a believer in him. And I am a believer in him. Those of us in this very room today did not per personally witness the event we say is the foundation of our faith. And yet, it is the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that has illuminated our hearts to the truth as we hear the word proclaimed and believe. What does the word say? Faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's this word. It's this proclamation. And this is Paul's argument here in this text. Christ's resurrection was part of the apostolic preaching that God used to plant the church. It is this word that our entire faith is based upon. Therefore, if our certainty about what we believe is not based on this sure word, then we are without hope, dead in our sins, and our religion is worthless. What Paul would have us realize is that the reason we believe and are gathered together here to hear the word of God in the first place is that this is the same word that brought our faith into existence. What does our brother James say? Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. What does that mean? God gave birth to you in Jesus Christ. He gave you the new birth. He brought you into his kingdom, and he created all the love in your heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. You saw Christ. You saw the horror of your sin. You turned away from sin, and you turned towards Jesus when you heard the proclamation of this message, and you trusted in him and you were saved. The point is this, the Word of God is what creates the Christian church. The Word of God and the proclamation of this message is what makes it possible for believers in 21st century America, all the way on the other side of the world from where these events happened 2,000 years ago, to be gathered together worshiping the Lord God of Israel. Why are you sitting in that pew today worshiping the God of Israel? All the way on the other side of the world, far disconnected from these events in time and in space because the word of truth brought your faith into being. Amen. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. The message of the resurrection so reoriented the lives and practice of the early church that they began meeting on the first day of the week the Lord's Day, and that is why we do. And though every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, we commemorate it especially today, proclaiming that all things are being made new in the Lord Jesus. Sunday marks the beginning of the new creation, and we celebrate this today in our calendar, which is the reason why we have our calendar in the first place. All of history is before Christ, or after death. There's a reason for that, because this event is so seismic that it actually turns the creation upside down. What could displace the Sabbath ordinance for the people of God to, to meet together on the first day of the week? Creation, new creation in Jesus. So know this, that as we leave here today, brothers and sisters, none of our work in the Lord is in vain. As we observe the glory of the resurrection, be steadfast and immovable in it. Christ's resurrection is the pledge of our resurrection. It is God's promise. And he is at work now, preparing a kingdom to hand over to the Father, working in you and in me and in his world to bring it about. And he will not be frustrated in his plans. 
He will not grow faint or weary until he has established justice and righteousness in the earth and among the nations and drawn all the nations to him. And our commission is very, very simple. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. That's the charge. That's the basis of our charges because he owns it all. It's all his. All authority in heaven and on earth. Go therefore because it's all his. Make disciples of all nations. Discipline them. Teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded. And the assurance is this. I will be with you to accomplish it all. We have the assurance of the risen Lord Jesus with us by his spirit to carry out this divine mandate and calling that we have been given in him. It cannot fail. It cannot be unsuccessful. And God himself will see it through. And so the resurrection should give us an unlimited hope today, not just in our own lives as individuals, not just in our own families and our marriages and our children, but in the world around us. God is making all things new. Amen? Amen. All right, please join me in praying.